basic animal ID tricks. And again, if anyone has things they want to add, everyone has their own experience with animal ID. ID. Again, I'm a, I'm a plant, bio, uh, plant ecologist. So if you want to chime in and, and add things, feel free to. Um, but our kind of rule of thumb is that you're always using more than one characteristic to confirm the species that's present in a photo. Um, <clears throat> color is the worst thing to go by. It should never be used as the primary way of tagging an animal because there's high variability in species coloration. Um, and so we always say, you know, if you think it's a fox squirrel because it's kind of rusty orange in color, look for other, another marking or another indicator that will confirm to you that it is in fact a fox squirrel. And that may be the size of the body, right? If you see a deer, you know it's a deer because there's nothing, nothing that compares to the size of a deer. Um, the body shape, so raccoons tend to be fatter and rounder. Possums tend to be leaner and longer, right? Um, specific markings, so raccoon tails and masks, um, the specific markings on red fox with their black booties and, and blacks on the backs of their ears, how the tail is shaped, how the tail is held, um, and eye glow. And so we talked a lot about this last week that, you know, we don't always get, get photos that are really clear photos. You may get a tip of a tail, you may get an eye glow, you may get something that's very blurry. And to be being able to decipher and, and come up with one or two characteristics that make you reasonably confident that the species that you're tagging is the correct species is what you're looking for. So the, the first thing I want to talk about, and again, this has changed a little bit in the new, I'm realizing how much I need to update this, is the difference between nothing and unknown. And in the new database, it's actually empty and unknown. So what's happened is when we first started this project, it was essentially Butler or Indianapolis and Chicago, and we were using Microsoft Access to analyze this data, and we both had our our own, our own databases and our own species tags. And when we switch to this online platform, we now have about 28 cities in the US and Canada that are all collecting data. And we have all kind of merged the, the names that we give different species. And so with our new database, nothing has turned into empty. So your tag, if there's absolutely nothing in the photo is going to be empty. Your tag, if there's something in the photo, but you're not sure what it is and you have no way of identifying it is unknown, okay? And so my rule of thumb is to always assume there's an animal triggering a camera. Um, most of the time, if it's a larger animal, you're gonna be able to tell the difference and sometimes toggling between the photo before and the photo after, right? Toggling between can help you look at shadows and movement in that scene to help you see if there's something actually there. So sometimes I'll actually toggle back and forth to see if there's movement between the images, especially if they're close in timestamp. Sometimes our cameras are triggered by shadows and leaves blowing, right? Um, and so we do have a lot of empty photos, but the rule of thumb is to always assume there is some sort of animal trigger, triggering in the camera. You can switch back and forth between photos and see if there's some sort of movement that you see. You can, there's an option to zoom in. You can also change the contrast on your computer. It's not as easy to change the contrast. There's not an option to do it in the new database, which I hate but sometimes I will turn my own screen brightness and change the contrast just for when I'm tagging photos so I can um, get the clearest um, visualization of the photo as possible. There is an option in the new database to zoom in. So the difference between nothing and unknown, nothing means you can't find anything in the image even if the detail of the image is difficult or impossible to see. So sometimes we'll have images that are just really bright white, right? So we're getting some sort of reflection from our infrared flash or the sun is shining directly in the camera and you just can't really make out anything in the image. I would mark that as empty or nothing, right? Um, sometimes the image is so dark that you really can't make out whether or not there's anything in the photo at all. And again, you would mark that as nothing or empty. Other times, 
the image, you can see the detail fine and you kind of zoom in and you can't see anything and you're pretty confident that it's triggered by a leaf or something because you can't find anything. In that case, you would mark it as empty. Um, unknown means that you see something in that photo, but you can't identify it. So it may be a blur that's, you know, if you flip back to the prior photo in the series, it's not there. And suddenly in the next photo, it's there. You know there's something there but it's so blurry or it's so washed out that you cannot identify it, we would label that as unknown. So that means that you know there's something in the field of that camera, but you're not confident enough to tag it as a particular species. So those are the two kind of tags in those situations where you're not able to identify the species. So chipmunks are one of those that they're super small, you know, our detection probability for chipmunks is really low. We don't, we probably won't do much with that data just because this kind of methodology isn't great for capturing, for getting a sense of presence in the absence of chipmunks because you're only gonna really be able to see chipmunks that are kind of climbing on the top of a log, right? That if they're crawling underneath a leafy understory in October, you're gonna see movement. The capture, the camera's gonna capture movement of leaves, but you're not gonna, going to see that chipmunk. But if you do see a chipmunk, clearly, you know, it's going to look like a squirrel. It has a less bushy tail, but the clear marking is that stripe down, down the sides of its body. And so if you see a chipmunk, we do have a tag for a chipmunk, and you can go ahead and tag it as so. Um, but you're kind of balancing this, finding the species with also being able to finish your tagging, right? So you don't want to spend five minutes on a photo right? You want to spend a minute, 30 seconds on a photo and move on and get through your photos, right? And that's why we're kind of condensing this data into daily values to minimize the error involved in just having to move through. We currently have about 750,000 photos, right? So here's an example, and you might need to change um, the contrast on your screen of a chipmunk right here. And you can tell with the shading of the understory, you know, it could be very, very easy to miss that chipmunk. And that's why toggling back and forth between two photos at the same site might be helpful. But again, if you miss this guy, it's not the end of the world. We're not doing a whole lot with um, the chipmunk data just because the detection probability is pretty low for them. I think all the chipmunks are at my house anyway. So. Oh, yeah? Are they getting underneath your house? Um, they're definitely burrowing in and around. I'm Gonna yeah. have to do something about them this. this yeah, year. my my sister has said the same problem at her house. Yeah. Yeah. There's at least thirty. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> well, maybe you should do a little experiment on what makes your house so attractive to chipmunks. Well, there is at least five walnut. Ah. Trees, five oak trees, and a, a what do you call them? A buckeye tree in my backyard. So there's plenty of seed. For them to eat so they're healthy and fat and reproduce a lot of squirrels yeah 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 a ton yeah they just found some gray squirrels moving in too they used to be all fox squirrels but well the gray squirrels may chase chase out the fox squirrels oh, really grays, grays are really territorial from what i've heard yeah it's weird I mean, because they're smaller than fox but um they're well, pretty precious <laughs> i know some small dogs that scare big dogs so, yeah, <laughs> so size isn't size isn't everything so yeah um so two two animals that are pretty obvious that you're going to see on camera depending on where your sites are are domestic dogs and cats um so dogs are typically pretty obvious unless you get a dog that you know like a husky or a malamute that's going to start looking more wolf coyote like um but typically dogs are pretty obvious um, the thing about dogs is they carry themselves very differently from coyote, typically. Their heads are going to be more up and looking around and their tails are up, right? So if you see a dog running through the site, they're typically not running in fear, they're running in joy. <laughs> and so their tails are going to be upright, their posture is very different, and, and most dogs look very different from coyotes. Um, we do have a secondary tag for dogs, which is on or off leash, um, and so if you see a leash, um, there's a tag for both of those in the database. 
Um, so if you can remember to just check those secondary tags. And the more you do it, the more you'll remember which, which species have particular tags. Um, we get a lot of cats um, all over. Actually, I thought we would see more feral cats closer to the city, but we see a lot of them in kind of Carmel, Zionsville area. Um, cats can look very similar to raccoons at times in photos. And so one of the key differences, well, first their face shape and their ear shape's different. But for me, one of the key indicators is the tail. And so typically a cat is gonna have, they always kind of walk with like a curl on the top of their tail or they'll hold their tail downward, but there'll be a curl as they're holding it downward, it'll be curled up. Whereas a raccoon, the tail is always held straight and almost straight out from the body, right? And so that posturing of the tail is a really, if you can see the tail in the photo, is a really good indicator. Um, and then also coloration, you know, you're looking for those distinct markings on raccoons. Um, cats, their eye glow is very, very similar to possum and raccoons. They're kind of very round at the front of the face. The other thing you'll notice about cats as you get used to tagging photos at particular sites is you'll notice that the same cat will frequent the same path of the same site every day. So they do kind of their daily tour of the area. And so the more you get familiar with a particular site, the more you'll kind of say, okay, this cat's going to start coming around at this time. Oh, there it is, right? And so they tend to frequent. We do have a secondary tag for cats. It's um, whether they have a collar or not. In my experience, I have never gotten a good enough picture of a cat to be able to tell whether they're wearing a collar or not. <laughs> so I've actually never used the secondary tag at all. Um, and so I wouldn't take it too seriously either in your in your tagging. But the dogs, it's it's pretty pretty easy to tell whether they're on a leash or off a leash. Usually when they're on a leash, you'll either see the leash or they'll be next to a human. Um, and there's a way I'll show you to add multiple detections of multiple species in one photo. So humans are another tag. We do keep track of humans. The, um, so these are people that are walking through the sites, people who are maintaining the sites, vehicles we typically tag as human. And we have a couple of secondary tags. Researcher is one. So again, we take a picture of ourselves every time we're interacting with the site. And that's really helpful because sometimes our cameras malfunction and we'll reset to like January 1st, 2015. And if we have pictures of ourselves and we write down the times in which we're deploying a camera, checking a camera and pulling a camera out of the field, we're able to back calculate and, and correct those times. And so that's partly why we do that. And so we always mark kind of researchers, human researcher. Um, and then we always tag mowers as mowers as well, because what you'll get is, you know, 30 to 50 photos of someone just going back and forth um, with a mower or a weed whacker. And so we have secondary tags for that. You will get lots of tags of other humans in the area. Vehicles, we've kind of gone both ways. Sometimes I'll tag it as um, just human because that's a reality of um, if our site's more urban we're getting a lot of vehicle traffic. Certainly that's uh, affecting the animals. Um, we've had other sites where we've had so much vehicle traffic that just everything's tagged human. And I would, I'd be interested in your input um, on what to do in that situation. Usually if we have a camera, so we had one site, for example, that was up near 62nd Street that was just like a tiny strip of trees and we had a camera. It was right next to a school. And so during school, um, drop off and pick up times. We are just capturing hundreds of photos of cars. And we actually decided to move that camera or shift the direction of that camera to minimize what we are capturing. And it really was a big discussion because the reality is that traffic is affecting the presence or absence of animals at that site. But at the same time, what good does it do us to go through 2000 photos of cars, right? And so um, I think you'll probably encounter this as you're selecting some of your sites and where to place the cameras, thinking about kind of that tension. And I think there's other ways to get at human um, human interaction at these sites. So, you know, one of the measurements we've been using for G, uh, using GIS is isolation index. So you're looking at the habitat patch size and you're ranking the surrounding land use types around it, right? And so that's one way to get at 
you know, is this forest patch surrounded by um, recreational parks or is it surrounded by parking lots and highways, right? Um, so there may be a better ways to get at kind of the human element, but we do tag humans. And we do get humans walking through sites. So you're gonna see some interesting stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> We've captured a lot of interesting stuff on camera as well. Okay, raccoons are pretty easy. Um, they're midsize. Um, you can see they have a, a pretty rounded back. So they posture very differently than cats and possums, which I think are the two other species that if you have a blurry photo, they're kind of hard to tell the difference between. So raccoons almost always have a rounded back, whereas cats and possums, their, their back tends to be held straighter. Raccoons tend to be a bit larger, not always, but tend to be. That's I'm using these tend to be because you want to use multiple um, indicators. And so they're mid-size, rounded body. They can be gray to completely black. So if you don't see stripes or the mask on the face, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a raccoon. We have a raccoon that lives on Butler's campus that's 100% black, has no markings. So color again and markings are not always and shouldn't be the only um, indicator that you use to identify an animal. However, if you do see that striped tail, and that mask and that tail is being held straight out the body. It doesn't have a curl at the end. You know, raccoons probably a pretty confident ID for that. Um, they're, oh, sorry. Their eyes are round and set at the front of the head. So if you get a night photo, you're gonna see kind of dinner plate eyes and you're gonna be able to see both of them most of the time, right? And even if it's, they're kind of, you're getting them at an angle, you're gonna probably be able to see one of their eyes. Although I recently had a raccoon with only one eye. Um, that threw me off a little bit, um, but it, he, he was a kind of a rough and tumble raccoon. <laughs> um, other indicators, usually very, very often we see raccoons in groups. And so if I see more than one set of dinner plate eyes or body shapes like this, the first thing I think is raccoon. Um, they often spend a lot of time in front of the camera. Um, and so you'll see the same raccoon or group of raccoons kind of roaming in front of the camera for five, 10 minutes. Um, not to say that, that possums, you don't see them in groups, but more typically you're gonna see raccoons. And so you start to kind of learn these nuances the more you tag. Um, most often when I've seen raccoon in groups, it's been family groups, so with babies, smaller. Um, whereas with um, raccoons, you'll see adult raccoons traveling in groups all the time. Raccoon eyes are a bit larger than possum as well, um, and they have a very different face shape. Usually with possums, you can see that very clear white point in their face. So here is an example of not a great picture of a raccoon. In this case, you can only see one eye, but you can see that distinct black stripe around the eye. And there's no other species, not even really cats, that are gonna have that distinct marking. So if you see that eye glow, look for that dark set behind the eyes, and that's really a strong indicator um, that it's a raccoon. You can also see the start to this very rounded back, which is another indicator for me that it's a raccoon. So possums have very similar eye glow. Um, they're usually smaller than raccoons, depending on the age. They're longer than raccoons and they have that very pointy snout. Their coloration is always a big indicator to me, especially at night, because they have this white undercoat with kind of a grayish black overcoat. They almost look, I don't know if iridescent is the word, but their coat has a special glow to it at night, especially in the infrared flash. Um, where you can kind of see the the white undercoat and then that black on top. And it's very different than seeing kind of the raccoon coloration at night. Um, if you can see the tail, you know it's a raccoon, right? Um, we don't catch, I don't think I've ever seen a rat on photo. I think they're too small. Um, and so if you see kind of that rat-like tail, you know it's a raccoon. Um, but the other indicators are that really clear kind of pointy white snout, those little tiny black ears often show up. They're, they carry their backs more linearly, not as rounded as a raccoon as well. And typically they're solitary. 
um, unless they're in a family group. And typically I don't see them climb. So, you know, and this isn't, when I say typically, this means you may see one climbing, right? Um, but I'll see raccoons climb pretty regularly. What I see with possum is they might be like on their back legs and like leaning up a tree, especially if there's a lure there. We don't use lure anymore, but I very seldom see them actually up on a tree, um, climbed up it. That doesn't mean you'll never see that, but in my experience, um, I don't see that very often. Eastern cottontail rabbits are small to midsize. They have a very rounded body and it's very condensed when they're still, right? And then when they are moving, their bodies are very elongated. Typically, you can see the ears. That's a big indicator. If you can see those big ears, there's nothing else with those big ears that lies that low to the ground. They have that bushy tail, which actually is not that great of an indicator because you have to have the perfect angle on a picture. Um, but another big indicator is their eyes. So their eyes are set so far on the side of their head, especially at night. If I see one single eye, I lean toward rabbit. Now, again, that raccoon recently threw me off <laughs> because it only had one eye. But typically at night, you're only going to see one eye or one streak of an eye if it's, if it's moving. Um, and so that very kind of condensed, no other animal you're going to see if it's sitting still is going to be that sh that's kind of short and compact as a rabbit. Rabbits are really, really hard to find during the day especially in the fall when the leaves are falling and they blend in really well with the leaf color. I'm telling you in the fall, you really need to zoom in and look really hard for rabbits in particular because they're really good at blending in. Um, they're usually solitary or in pairs. So I'll see them both in pairs um, and solitary as well. So deer are usually pretty obvious, right? If you see something this large in Indiana, it's going to be a deer. Of course, we do get smaller ones if they're babies. The babies typically have little um, spots on their sides. Um, um, typically they're with adults, but not always. Sometimes adults will be out of the frame of the camera. Um, and so long legs, large body, very large ears. Sometimes we'll see antlers. There's some secondary tags. If you see antlers, I usually tag it as antler. If there's young present, I'll tag it as young present. Their color can be a little bit of variable from tan to red. Um, the fawns have spots. I will say these animals are so large that sometimes you'll just see, like if you look where my hand is, say like my screen is the photo, sometimes you'll just see the back of the animal because they're so close to the camera or you'll see just an antler and it's like this across the photo right um and so though in those situations sometimes it's really difficult and you might guess that it's, that it's a deer they're just very close to the camera and so it can be a little challenging if they get close to the camera but if you see something super large that's taking up the frame of the camera most likely it's a deer or a human um, um, at night, their eyes are set far apart from their head. You can usually see them both. As you see with um, this deer here looking straight on, you're gonna be able to see them both, but they're set farther apart than, than a coyote or, or any other animal. Um, and what I will say about deer is, if you see one in the foreground, always look far in the background of the photo because typically there are three, four, five more. <laughs> um, and so pay attention to kind of the background of that photo. Um, you'll often see more than one, not always, but often. So coyotes, you can see, hold themselves very different from dogs. Um, they typically position their head downward, not always, especially if they're alert to something. But if you notice their tail, out of the hundreds of coyote photos that I've looked at, I have never seen the tail positioned in any other way, straight down. Very different from a fox and from a domestic dog. Maybe a domestic dog, if they're sniffing something, their tail's hanging down. But for me, uh, a coyote positions itself very, very differently. And they're gonna be much larger than a fox. They have a dog-like snout, but it's typically narrower than most dogs. 
They have really large ears compared to the head size. And oftentimes their ears are kind of not really <laughs> straightforward. They're kind of, especially in urban areas, they're kind of mangy looking. And you can see in these two photos, I picked them specifically because there's a huge variation in color. We'll see brown, gray, and even red coyote. And so color is not always a, gra a great indicator of whether it's a coyote or not. But that kind of positioning of the tail and the tail tapers toward the end and it always typically ends in kind of a dark tip. Those are kind of those, those indicators that it's a coyote. Um, they're going to have canine looking eye glow, eyes close together, but almond shaped. And typically they're solitary. Um, and again, unless there's young present. Um, but, but thinking about how these two photos of coyote are kind of just their body positions are very different than how a domestic dog would position their bodies. Um, and that their tail is tapered and hanging down, I think are two big indicators for me of coyote. They don't climb. Um, so if you see something that looks like a dog climbing a tree, it's probably not a coyote. Red fox, on the other hand, are going to be much smaller than coyote. Um, their, um, their torso is kind of the same length as the tail. So they're going to be Coyote tend to have pretty long, lanky legs, whereas fox tend to be have shorter legs relative to the length of their torso. Um, they have a very narrow snout, and their tail, if you look at it, because sometimes all we get is a tail on a photo, it doesn't taper. It's the same width all the way down to the end, okay? And so that's one easy way to tell the difference between a coyote and a fox in a photo where you just have a tail is the, the fox tail is wide all the way down. Other indicators of fox are they look like they're wearing black stockings. They're, they have a white tip on their tail instead of a black tip like coyotes. And they're gonna have black tips on the backs of their ears. They tend to have white underbellies. And I know it's easy to think, okay, I see a fox. If I have a picture of a fox like this, it's super obvious, but sometimes you only get the back of the head with the ears, right? Ooh. And so looking for those markings on the ears that are black splotches is really help, are really helpful. I will tell you that in younger fox, sometimes these dark markings aren't as developed. And so I've seen some very young fox kits that don't quite have the black stockings yet because their coloration hasn't come about. So in, in younger fox, sometimes those colorations aren't as obvious. Typically, we see fox solitary, unless it's a family group. You can tell their stance is very different from a coyote. So most of the time, a fox, their tail is not hanging down low. It's sticking out straight. And if they're moving, it's actually in line with their back. So they're holding their tail not down, not up like a dog, but almost in line with their back. Um, and so their posturing is very different. Um, Red fox typically don't climb. If you see a fox-like animal that's climbing, it's a gray fox. We don't think we have any gray fox in Indianapolis. We have them in southern Indiana. But please let me know if you think you found a gray fox. Um, they do climb. They're climbing foxes. Um, and fox are very similar to cats in that they'll make the same rounds at the same time every day. So we have sites where we know we have a fox or a fox family that are going to be coming in front of the camera and we can predict what time they're coming in front of the camera. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on gray fox, but this is what a gray fox looks like. Again, um, I've, I've never seen them in the Indianapolis area and I would be surprised if we do, but if you all do, please let me know because they're adorable. <laughs> um, and they, they climb trees. Um, and so I'll just kind of keep this here in this recording. I'm not going to go through the details because I will be very surprised if we see any um, in Indianapolis. Beavers are larger than groundhogs. They're very compact and chubby. They have short webbed hind, short legs and webbed hind feet. They're typically kind of this reddish brown in color. The telltale sign is that scaly flat paddle of a tail. Um, they look very rodent-like. They have large teeth. Typically they're found near water. 
Um, we don't have a lot of photos of beaver and we have a couple sites where we tend to see beaver, um, but it's not, you know, it's not something that's super common for us. Um, more commonly, we will see groundhogs or woodchucks, which are the same thing. Again, they look very much like beavers. They're typically a little smaller, although we do have a lot of very large woodchucks um, in Indianapolis. They have short chubby legs as well, but they're non-webbed. The big difference is that they have a hairy tail instead of a flat paddle-like scaly tail, and they tend to be more yellowish brown or gray in color. They're also often found about around water, but they can also be found in other areas. We do see mink um, somewhat irregularly at some of our sites. Anytime you see something that looks like a ferret, that is dark in color, it is a mink. There, there's really no other species, native species around um, that looks like a mink. Um, they have a very elongated body. Um, they're really long and thin. I should say thin, not think. Um, they're really dark brown. Typically we see them at night. So seeing that little white chin patch or a little white chest hair, <laughs> you're probably not gonna see in photos, um, but you're gonna really notice it by that this kind of dark weasel like shape running across the top of a log and most often we see them solitary and near water. So the last group of species that you're going to be really challenged with figuring out are um, squirrels and squirrels are some of the most challenging um, species to identify because they're they're highly variable and they all, they're all very similar and they're small, which means our cameras don't always pick up kind of the nuanced differences between these species. The good news is our collaborator, um, Carmen Salisbury, is a squirrel expert. And so what we've kind of done in the past is we really push people to try to identify fox squirrel, tree squirrel, red squirrel, and flying squirrel, which are four squirrel species, two species. But if it's a black and white photo, you may not be able to, or if you have a bad photo, you may not be able to. And in that case, we have an option where you can tag tree squirrel. So you know it's a squirrel, you know it's a tree squirrel, not a ground squirrel. And then Carmen actually goes in and looks more specifically at that photos and tries to identify them to species. Hey, Julia? Yeah. Hey, uh, do we not find weasel in central Indiana? I have not found them on camera. Okay. Um, you may, you may, um, and that may be, it's not a part of this typical, we do have them as an option for tagging. So if you see one, there should be an option on the database to tag it that way. We have not seen them on camera, um, and I don't know why. And I also don't have skunk in this presentation because we have caught in the four or five years we've been doing this, we've caught maybe three skunk on camera. And we don't know if it's because the population is really low or if we're just don't have cameras at the sites where they're regularly present at. So there's some species I don't include in this that there's still an option to tag. Okay. Um, so weasel's one of those. Um, and there's a couple others that are available to tag, but that I don't really focus on in this presentation. And if there's ever a question, so once we kind of get you all onboarded, Patrick, I'm happy to add you um, and Forrest, if you're gonna be kind of a main person, we'll connect you to the Slack channel, which is all the researchers across the US and now Canada. And if you ever have a question, there's a, um, there's an option to get help tagging photos. And so you can throw a photo up there and say, what is this, right? Um, and so there's a way to get help with that as well. You can always email it to us as well and we can try to figure it out. So definitely weasels are present, but we haven't really captured um, that many or any photos of them that I know of. Yeah, I mean, a short time, I mean, we've had cameras out around for about a year and a half and we haven't really seen any, I think we may have one or two pictures of mink. But. Yeah, we don't get a lot of mink. We don't get a lot of squirrel. Um, we've gotten a couple muskrat. That's not on this presentation. Yeah. Um, just because they're not the more common species, but they certainly are species. And what I would tell your students 
is if they have an image that they're not sure of, that they send it to you, right? And that's kind of what we tell our students. We, we train them on the, the core species that they're going to be seeing most regularly. Yeah. And then those species like um, weasel, um, mink, you know, they can always, I think it's good for them to feel comfortable kind of just sending it out to the group and you can include our team on it as well. It's kind of fun to get a picture and, and try to decipher it right as a, as a team. So, uh, but we don't include it in this basic presentation. We also, um, we, yeah, I understand it. I just, yeah. And we, um, it's an option on the tagging. We also on this presentation, I don't include badger and we, um, recently, got our first photo of a badger and a flying squirrel this past year and flying squirrel you know we we know that they're in indianapolis um but badger i think we have the first um the first confirmed sighting of a badger in marion county in decades and we actually confirmed it with dnr because we were like they're not known as an urban species and so there are other species that you may see but i think in those instances it's good to bring it to the whole group to make sure that we all are kind of like wait is this really a badger you know yeah well, that's cool yeah um so the squirrels to me are the hardest um to tag and and identify and so a fox squirrel is typically the biggest of all the squirrels its tail, one of the telltale signs is its tail is longer than its body, right? So it has this really long, really bushy tail. That bushy tail, it's kind of hard to tell in this photo, but it has a little black fringe around the outside of it. And you can kind of tell in this photo. And so those to me are the two ways that I identify a fox squirrel. Primarily is the size the length of the tail is longer than the length of the body, and I look for that kind of black fringe around the edge of the tail. They typically are orange in color, um, and they have typically have kind of orange bellies, but this is really variable. Sometimes you can get fox squirrels that are almost black or gray looking. Sometimes their bellies can be yellow or even white, and so color for squirrels is definitely not the primary indicator. Um, that you want to go off of. So looking for the size and the kind of how the puffiness of the tail and that fringe, um, I think are the best ways um, to identify fox squirrels. And again, the more familiar you get with sites, there's a lot of sites that only have fox squirrels. There's a lot of sites that only have gray squirrels because they're highly territorial. And then there's some sites like Patrick's house <laughs> where they seem to live in harmony, right? And Butler's one of those sites where I think there's just so much, so many resources available that they're able to live in the same location. But even in, Indi in Indiana, we have certain cities that only have gray squirrel or fox squirrel, right? And so um, you'll get to know your sites the more you tag the photos for those sites um, and know kind of what species to expect um, more often than not. So gray squirrels, first of all, these pictures aren't in, um, in proper proportion, but if you look, gray squirrels are typically smaller, but you can tell a very distinct difference in tail size. So their tail length is about the same length as their body. And that's one of the big indicators for gray squirrels is if their tail is about the same length of their body and it's a little more sparse looking, it's not as bushy, um, that's the first sign where I start thinking, okay, maybe this is a gray squirrel. Instead of that black fringe around their tail, they actually have a white fringe around the outside of their tail. And so in a black and white photo, if you can tell that there's a white fringe and there's no black at all, that's an indication that it's a gray squirrel. Typically gray squirrels are gray and typically they have white on their bellies. Again, there's a lot of variability. And so color is not always always the best way um, to identify gray squirrels. In a black and white photo, you're typically not going to be able to tell the difference between species unless there's a very clear photo of the length of the tail, right? And in those cases, we have an option to tag it as a tree squirrel. So a tree squirrel indicates it's either a fox squirrel or a gray squirrel. We're not sure which one, but it's a tree squirrel. Um, and then Carmen will go in and, and start looking in more detail to see if she can figure it out. 
We also have a ground squirrel called a red squirrel. This is the smallest of the squirrels. So it's about chipmunk size, a little bit bigger than chipmunk, but it has a bushier tail and it doesn't have those clear markings down the lateral sides of the body. Um, its tail is like the gray squirrel is about the same length as the body. Typically uh, red squirrels and almost all of them that I've seen in the Indianapolis area so far have been red, like a very bright red and their bellies are, are white. Um, but there are variations that can be almost black. In the winter time, they have these little tufts that grow on their ears that almost look like little feathers. They're, it's adorable. Um, and so they're molted in the summer. So this is a summer photo, but if you can get a picture that you can tell those ear tufts, no other squirrel has those ear tufts. Um, their tails don't have any coloration other than red, right? Yeah. So if you're able to see the black fringe on a fox squirrel, the white fringe on a gray squirrel, and no fringe, just a solid color on a red squirrel. That's, that's one of the key indicators there.